has taken the spirit out of the church. Miracles and mysteries and the very manifestations of God are ignored, belittled, or explained away by science. And yet men and women are less fulfilled than ever before. There is no answer that man has. There is no answer that science has for the issue that we all face. The world has many ills, but the source of all of those problems are but one. It is the issue of sin. And for the world's many ills being boiled down into a singular issue, there is only one solution. The only solution to deal with sin is Jesus the King. Man has no answer for this thing of death. As is said, two things in life are guaranteed, taxes and death. You will meet both. All of us, no matter your age, will experience the sting of death. And yet Jesus has the answer. If you saw in the news, the sting of death is felt in a very real way this morning as over 70 people lost their lives in Kentucky on a single evening because of a tornado. This is the sting of death. There's so much uncertainty in the world. Before we come to God, before we give our lives over to him, before we study the Bible and find the answer, there's so much uncertainty. There's so much instability. There's so much fear, and that fear can control us and cause us to make really terrible decisions. Sometimes we're afraid to die. Simple as that. Sometimes we're afraid of what people think about us. Sometimes we're afraid for our financial futures. And instead of prioritizing God and his kingdom, we rather prioritize our lives and our financial security. Sometimes we're afraid of our moms. Sometimes we're afraid of our dads. Sometimes we're just simply afraid. And as... Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. God does not want us to be afraid this morning. As a matter of fact, when Moses died and Joshua was risen up as the leader of his people, he commands him to be strong and courageous. He says, do not be afraid. Now, why was he afraid? Because he was a young man and he was stepping into the shoes of the greatest leader that God's people had known up until that point. And Joshua did not know what to do. And God says, listen, you don't know what to do. You're going a way that you do not know, that you were unfamiliar with. And that's exactly how God wants it to be. And he says, even though you don't know where you're going, don't be afraid, but be strong and courageous. Well, where was Joshua to get his courage from? From the very word of God. Verse 8, it says, meditate day and night on this word and be careful to do everything in it. If you've decided this morning that you're simply going to obey every word of the Bible, you have nothing to fear. Not even death can separate you from your God when you've decided to obey his word. With so much uncertainty in the world, let's talk about what is certain. Amen? Amen. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. The Bible prophesies that Jesus would be born of a virgin. And it says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. You know, the Bible prophesies that Jesus would be born of the virgin womb. Now, that's either true or it's not. Mary is either the mother of God or she was a loose woman who conceived the child before her marriage. Now we know that she is the mother of God and that the prophecy was fulfilled. This is a certainty. What else do we know? It was prophesied that Jesus would be born into the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49 verse 10. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Not only did it get prophesied that he would be born into Judah, but even the town in which he would be born was prophesied. Little old Bethlehem. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says, But you, Bethlehem, Epaphrathah, 
Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Now people look at Tampa and they think Tampa's small. They think Tampa's not a global city. I've even heard people don't expect that much from the church in Tampa. But you, Tampa, International Christian Church of the Gulf Coast of Florida, where it's 85 degrees in the middle of December. Amen. Though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Jesus is going to be born into the hearts of those that become disciples and are baptized into his name. You know, it's incredible is that today, Corey has come to be baptized. Amen. Now, Corey's a big man. And he's an intimidating man. But he's a big, he's a big teddy bear. Amen. And you're going to see he's going to become an amazing addition to God's kingdom. Christ is going to be born into the heart of Corey today. Amen. What are the chances that the Old Testament would identify not only the tribe, but the small town as well into which the Messiah would be born? Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 says that he would live in Egypt. What are the odds? Isaiah 9 1 to 2 says he'll then live in Galilee. What are the odds? Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 says he'll go into Jerusalem on a donkey for the triumphal procession. What are the odds? Zechariah 11, 12 to 13 said he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. What are the odds? Zechariah 12, verse 10 says he'll be pierced for our sins when he's crucified. What are the odds? Psalm 22, verse 18, they would cast lots for his clothing. His clothing. Psalm 34, verse 20 there would be no broken bones. You know, when somebody would be crucified, the way that they would expedite the crucifixion and end it so that it didn't carry on and on for days is they would come and it was called crucifracture and break the legs of the, the people being crucified so that then they would no longer be able to push themselves up on the nail that was driven between their feet. What happens when you're crucified is that you actually suffocate because you're hanging there and the pressure on your lungs is such that you can inhale but you can't exhale and of course the carbon dioxide builds up and you rapidly suffocate but what happens is that it gets uh, elongated because people will push up on their feet so that they can exhale and draw in further oxygen they come they break the legs so that you're no longer able to push up and then suffocation happens rapidly this was not needed for jesus jesus died because of heart failure not a single bone in his body was broken wow. what are the odds Let's look at a prophecy that Jesus himself made in John chapter 2. The celebration of the temple. That's what Christmas is really all about. And Jesus wanted to make sure that the temple was going to be something revealed and then something celebrated. John chapter 2 in verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Amen. You know, right here, Jesus prophesied that the temple would be destroyed and then raised again in three days. And of course, the temple that he was referring to was his own body. In verse 20, the Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it again in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. 
Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about him, for he knew what was in man. Jesus prophesied that he would rise from the dead. It is encouraging when Christmas comes to think about the baby being born into a manger. Amen? Uh, But why do we celebrate a baby being born into a manger? Because the man, Jesus, died and was resurrected. This is why we get to celebrate as such as disciples. It's incredible. The first point, you've got to clean it out to be devout. You know, Jesus shows up to the temple, and there's all kinds of, uh, of sin happening. And what would, what would occur is that basically you'd have the impoverished Israelites traveling miles and miles to arrive to the temple and make sacrifices for their offerings. And they set up this, uh, this basically this market where you would have to then buy the temple-issued sacrifice. You couldn't bring your own. And there was a, a, a basically a manipulation of the currency so that you would have to first trade your money for the temple's currency, that which was accepted there, and then buy this kind of standard issue sacrifice. So they were literally fleecing God's people, making money off of the backs of the Israelites. And Jesus sees this. He gets ticked off. He says, this is, number one, my temple. And Jesus' desire, the vision of God for the temple, was to be a house of prayer for all nations. Now, it's really incredible because the temple faced eastward. Now, the whole area inside the inner wall, including the temple courtyard and the different kind of patios and porticos, were considered as a part of the temple itself, not just the building. Amen? Now, the outside area was called the court of the Gentiles. So the Gentiles, even though they had converted many of them to Judaism, couldn't quite enter into the actual inner courtyard of the temple. They had to stay on the outer courtyard, that being the courtyard of the Gentiles. Now, Herod's temple, we remember from last week, was the one that was uh, began by Zerubbabel and then finished by Herod. Now, the original temple was 45 feet high. Herod built it another 15 feet higher, and it ended up being 60 feet high. And he also greatly expanded this court of the Gentiles, kind of like the lobby of the temple, if you will. Now, on the south side, you had what were called the colonnades, such as Solomon's colonnade. Amen? Now, we know from Acts chapter 5 that that is actually where the disciples would kind of gather there and meet up and pray and sing to God and then go out and preach the word. So it's pretty cool to see God's plan for his temple. Now, inside the walls, in the inner court, you'd find the women's court. Now, that was as far as the women were allowed to go. They could not enter or pass through the Nicanor gate. Now, once you pass through the Nicanor gate, you would then enter into the inner courts. So you guys following all this right here? Now, uh, now this is incredible because in the uh, women's court, you would find 13 kind of receptacles all around that court, and that is where the gifts or the offerings would be deposited as you went on into the inner courts. This is where Jesus sat down and saw the widow give her offering. This also ended up to be the place where Jesus uh, cleared out the temple. It was in the women's court. Now, you go past the Nicanor Gate, you walk up a flight of stairs about 15 steps made of brass. This is quite the spectacle right here. You come into the court of men, and then the court of the priests, and then the court of the Levites. Now, on a daily basis, the priest would enter the first part of the temple uh, and go into the holy place to make sacrifices. And only the high priest once a year would enter into the most holy place and have the very presence of God there at the mercy seat. Now, you guys remember, you you took notes last week. You've got the Ark of the Covenant. Now, above on the on the 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 the, uh, seal of the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat or this place in between the cherubim, these two angels with their wings up facing each other in that spot in the shadow of the wings of the angel is God's presence. That is where God communes with the high priest. Now, you remember what's special about that, that as a disciple, because of Jesus, we have access to the most holy place every single day. Does that not fire you on up right there? Now, when Jesus cleared the temple area, 
the disciples were witness to all of this. So they're traveling with Jesus, and then they see Jesus just kind of like uh, flip out a little bit right there. Amen. If you've ever been with the man of God or the woman of God, you know, sometimes you get a little bit fired up about certain things, and maybe you don't totally understand what it's all about, but you will. So there's the disciples, and they're with Jesus, and Jesus just gets ticked off. He starts flipping the tables, and the only thing that they can think, the only scripture that they can recollect, zeal for your house will consume me. That's how they viewed Jesus. Jesus was consumed with zeal for the temple of God. Look over at Mark chapter 11. How zealous are you this morning? Mark chapter 11, verse 15. It says here, this is a parallel passage. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called the house of prayer? for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. You know, this is incredible because, again, what's the vision for the temple of God? That it's a house of prayer for all nations. What's God's temp vision for his modern temple? What's God, God's vision for his church? That his church is a house of prayer for all nations. Now, they had turned it into a den of robbers. This is actually a reference to Jeremiah chapter 7. Let's go there. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 7. In verse 2. Right here, Jeremiah is preaching. He says, Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I'll let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your forefathers forever and ever. But look. You are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we're safe, safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Go now to the place of Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people, Israel. You know, right here, God says, listen, I've got a vision for the temple, that it becomes a place of worship, that it becomes a house of prayer for all nations. But God says, listen, even though my temple is a house of prayer for all nations, you need to reform your ways. You cannot think that you're safe because you come to the right church. Even being in a sold-out church in the kingdom of God does not guarantee your salvation. The Bible says you've got to work it out with fear and trembling. And you know, sometimes we can be this way. We say, it's the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. you got to come check out the Tampa Bay International Christian Church. It's the temple of the Lord. It's incredible. You're going to get discipled there. Amen? I mean, you're going to worship God there. It, you'll have the purpose for your life. And nevertheless... God says, you need to watch the way that you live. Because what really counts is Monday through Saturday and not just Sunday. How about it? How's your purity been? Have you been looking at stuff you shouldn't be looking at on the Internet? Have you been watching and, and movies that, that are chock full of sin? And thinking, it's, it's the temple of the Lord. I'm good. I'll just fast forward through it. Or maybe you just need to turn it off. Have you been mingling with sin, doing things that you know you ought not to do, not doing the things that you know you should do? The wages of sin, after all, are death. You know, God says, it's okay. I've been watching. I saw what you did last summer. You, you, you can't do all these detestable things and think you're going to be okay. 
Zeal for the house must consume you. And I find that when you're totally committed, when you're living the way that Jesus lived, man, you can't help but be filled with zeal. You know, the word in Spanish for zealous and jealous are the same words, the same word. It's the same in the Greek. Uh, to be jealous in Spanish is to be celoso. To be zealous in Spanish is to be celoso. Why? Because the zeal of God's house is the jealousy that God feels about his temple. Wow. And he says, listen, my temple will remain clean. My temple will be devout no matter what. And if I've got to clean it out to make sure it's devout, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Amen. Now, we also are the temple of God individually. We've got to say, we've got to clean it out to be devout. We've got to clean the inside of the cup, and then the outside will be clean also. You know, i never forget, I was talking to a great brother right there. You know, Chris, he really wanted to date Mary. And man, uh, this brother, he's an amazing brother. He's evangelistic. He has great quiet times. His righteousness, impeccable. And he's had his sights there on Sister Mary for quite some time. I think there was a string of Sundays, man. Every Sunday would be like, so he'd look at me like, I'm like, what, bro? Like, are you ready to give missions? Why are you looking at me like this? He's like, any news? I was like, bro, just pump the brakes a little bit, my friend, you know. Let's get a lot of advice. And one of the things I told him, I was like, bro, you got to clean your car if you want Mary to be your girlfriend. Now I'm really grateful for Chris because Chris comes to my house uh, every Sunday morning about 7.30 and he loads up the truck there with all the uh, sound equipment and I come out and, you know, he takes me to church. I'm really grateful for that, amen? And I'm very grateful for all those who serve in the kingdom. It, it is, uh, this doesn't happen magically or organically, amen? Uh, and I'm thankful for uh, Marley and Christine there who do so much. And, and then, you know, I, I got into Chris's car with, with my suit on. I said, bro, brother, bro, you got to clean your car. You got to clean your car. You got to be devout if you want to take Mary out. I just like, hey. You gotta. So in the following Sunday, he says, bro, look at the car. I cleaned it up. I said, bro, it looks good on the outside. I said, did you clean the inside? And his head just dropped. And I said, oh, bro, bro, bro. the outside. It, don't worry about the outside. You want Mary to come in on the car and say, oh, it's really nice and clean right here. Amen. So you got to clean it out to beat him out. And then he cleaned his car and then he started dating. Amen. Oh, and he says, hey, God says, listen, I want to remind you. Uh, it's not necessarily about what's happening externally. It's about who you are on the inside. That's the battle that you're going to have to fight as a disciple. That's the battle that you're going to have to fight this season. Yeah. Going into Christmas, you have, you have a choice here to make. Uh, it, it's easy. You know, I, I find even when the weather shifts a little bit, we can kind of get a little, we can have a little bit of an attitude. We can get a little bit rather moody. Are you with me? Yeah. Uh, it's a little hot and we get a little bit edgy. A little, little cold and dreary. We get a little bit moody. We get a little bit down. Even the coffee is not enough to kind of kick it into gear you got to make a decision that no matter what happens this Christmas season, this is more a time for you to give than it is for you to receive. That's what it's all about as a disciple. And it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know, it's, it's so interesting. Sometimes we get a little bit upset about what we are receiving from God. Isn't it? Maybe you feel like you haven't received from God what you want. Well, if you don't like what you're receiving, maybe change what you're giving. Amen? If you don't like what you're getting, change what you're giving. Focus outwardly instead of focusing inwardly, and God will bless you. It does say it is more blessed to give than to receive. What does it mean to be blessed? Superlatively happy. Those that give, those that have decided to be outwardly focused, to be focused on God and focused on meeting the needs of others are those that are oftentimes the happiest among us. Those that are generous of spirit, generous of heart, that are always looking for a way to give. And I find that in my own life, whenever I'm hoping to receive and then those expectations aren't met, I get a little moody. I get a little down. I can even get a little bit angry, a little bit terse, a little bit ticked off. 
Maybe I blame my discipler. You know, we got disciplers in the church, those that mentor us and help us to grow. Maybe I can get a little bit mad at the preacher right there. Amen. Okay, good. Had to take the pulse. Maybe get a little bit mad at your wife. Brothers are supposed to say no. Maybe get a little bit mad at your husband right there. Never, never. See, listen, this is, this is not a time to have our hands out, hoping to be given to. This is a time to search our hearts and give to others. First to God and then to our brothers and sisters. You know, verse 12, he says, go now to the place of Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. Well, where was Shiloh? In 1 Samuel, if you recall, that's where the Philistines came and captured the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God. That place was decimated. And he says, listen, if you do not clean it out, I will decimate this place also. You must ensure that your heart is righteous before God. Now, it's easy to tell when somebody's being righteous. There's no way to hide it. Amen? Uh, you know, at Devo, we talked about uh, those that have been forgiven much, love much. And those that have been forgiven little, love little. And this is based uh, in Luke chapter 12, where you find Mary Magdalene, who breaks the alabaster jar of pure nard and anoints Jesus to prepare him for burial. And it says that she wets his feet with her tears. And then he even wipes his feet with her hair. Yeah. And it says that when she broke this alabaster jar of pure nard, this is worth about a year's wages. She says, listen, my relationship with God is more valuable than even my most prized possession. Yeah. And as my wife always illustrates, when she broke that bottle of perfume, the whole aroma just kind of wafted through the house. I mean, you, if you were there, you'd just like, whoa, it was unmistakable. I told the uh, campus students that I went through a bit of a phase when I was in high school. I'm through a few phases, amen. And at one point, uh, I had nothing but uh, the clothing brand Dickies in my closet. Amen. Get a little bit of an uh, insight into who I was right there. And uh, I mean, I, I even named some of my outfits. I had uh, white, the white Dickie pants and the brown shirt. And I used to call it brown sugar right there, amen. <laughs> I mean, it, was, I, it, was, it wasn't bad. It, it wasn't really fitting. Like, it looked a little weird that I had all that on, but the outfit was nice enough. And I remember I had a, a bottle of Fahrenheit cologne, oh. Christian Dior. Uh, oh. And I'd open the closet, and I'd take this bottle, I'd just like, and just saturate my clothing with this perfume. And then, of course, every morning before I went on the bus, I just hit it with another, you know, for good measure. And I get onto the bus, and people are like, oh, you're doing too much. And when Mary broke the alabaster jar of perfume, everybody, it just hit them. And every time they smelled that scent, you better believe they remembered that moment. And let me tell you something. We're spiritual beings. And you got to ask yourself, what kind of fragrance is wafting from you when you come into church? Is it pleasant? Is it, is it peppermint? Or is it spiritual gingivitis? I think one of the sisters at one point at Devo said, coming in smelling a little musty. Amen? Now remember, this is to be a celebration of the temple, not a desecration of the temple right there. And you got to be deliberate. It would be crazy to consider if you went anywhere in public and didn't kind of get dressed. And, and, you know, maybe you got some gum there on reserve right there. Amen. Uh, you, you, you've washed up. You've brushed your teeth. You've flossed. You used mouthwash. You're ready to waft a pleasing aroma. Now, spiritually, it's the same thing. And let me tell you something. People can smell you coming from a mile away. We are spiritual beings, and we can perceive when somebody is just cranking it out for the Lord. Yeah. You know, I'm so proud of my sister, Danelli. She was just baptized last Sunday, amen. Her along with Michelle. And uh, 
you, you see these sisters, and you know, I, I saw Danelli on, uh, on, I believe it was Monday or Tuesday night, and uh, we had a meeting at Panera Bread on, on Bruce B. Downs, and then I saw Nicole and Danelli come into the Panera Bread kind of unexpectedly, and I saw Danelli, and she was just like, <laughs> and I, I, I said, Danelli, are you fired up? She's like, of course I'm fired up. I just like, <laughs> and you see all her posts on Facebook, and there's this really meaningful posts from the Bible. Yeah. And you, you couldn't hide it even if you tried, even if you tried. And there's so many incredible examples like that in the church. You got to clean it out to be devout. You know, what does this mean? There's a contrast between religiosity and sin and hypocrisy versus a personal relationship with God. You must have a personal relationship yeah, right. with God. You know what I love about our church? There is no way to hide. Amen. Uh, you know, there's 80 people in here or something to that effect. And, yeah. of course, the church has been growing. It's going to continue to grow and uh, get over 100. And yeah. we'll, con you know, continue to sectorize. Of course, we've got the, the east sector right there. Yeah. And then you got the, the west sector right there. I don't know which one's more fired up, amen? And you say, well, we, want, we don't want just east and west. We want south and north and on over to the, the coast and into Lakeland and down to Brandon and Riverview to Sarasota, Fort Myers, Naples, Dade City, Spring Hill, and the world. This is, this is what we want. And you know what? We're not trying to necessarily only build vertically so that it grows numerically. We're trying to expand. Why? Because Christianity happens when nobody's looking. And it happens at the, at, the, at the cellular level, at the granular level, at the Bible talk level. In our church, we have what are called Bible talks. These are family groups. These are small groups. Now, what makes it effective is not just that we have a small group. Because some religious churches, worldly churches, really have caught on. You can't miss it, really, if you read the Bible. And you see, oh, wow, Jesus worked through small groups. Simply having small groups in your church does not make it a discipling church. Yeah. Using the word uh, discipleship does not mean that your church actually does Jesus' ministry. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the difference? One of the differences is that everybody in the church here is a totally sold-out disciple. Yeah. That's the difference. You don't have a variance in the expectation or the standard right there. Now, the output can look a little bit different. Everybody's cross is a little unique to them. Now, your cross is, is, is heavy, isn't it? Yeah. And you might look at somebody else's cross like, that little old thing, Psh, put it on a chain. Psh. You know what I mean? This is nothing. This is, no, no, no. For them, that's, that's a heavy burden right there. Amen? That's what God has given them. But when you get together at a small group, you say, listen, we care about each other. We're going to get open with our lives. Yeah. We're going to be transparent. We're going to talk about what's really going on on the inside, the stuff that's hard to talk about. And I find that the longer you've been around, the longer you can go and kind of be okay without really spilling your guts and walking in the light. God wants us to be transparent. You've got to clean it out to be devout. You know, all our disciples understand, hey, we, we're at church on Sunday. Amen? We don't miss church. That's just... That's just not something we've got the habit of doing. It's every once in a blue moon, amen? For me to miss church, i got to be dead. Amen. Honestly. Now, you might uh, do some traveling, and you go to the church over there in St. Louis. Are you with me? Or you go to the church in Sacramento. Or you go to our church in uh, Seattle. But you say, listen, i got a conviction. I do not miss church. As a matter of fact, in the last 15 years, I missed one Sunday service. And it was the Sunday after my wedding, which was on a Friday. And guess what? Rachel and I had a, a communion time right there on Sunday morning. Amen. Now, when you get married, I'm going to send you out, and you don't have to come to church that Sunday. You've got to have church on your honeymoon. Amen. Are you with me right there? If you get married and come to church the next day, I'm just going to tell you to go home. I don't want to see you, okay? Uh, but you see, like, this is the conviction. Uh, we, we don't miss midweek services right there. Why? We, we, we don't miss devos. We don't miss Bible talk. Why? Because we don't go to church. We are the church. Yeah. And really, we, we go to the world. We have to kind of go to work, amen? Like, we go visit our jobs. Hey, how you doing? Hey, would you like to come and, and, and actually experience what true life is all about oh, yeah. by coming to the kingdom of God? Uh, we are not uh, students that happen to go to church, entrepreneurs that happen to go to church, 
doctors and lawyers and rappers that happen to go to church. We are disciples that happen to go to school and do all the rest of those types of things. And you better believe it, as a disciple, we do it better than anybody. Religiosity, sin, and hypocrisy will get you nowhere. As a matter of fact, it'll work against you. It'll take you further away from God than when you began. In, in the religious world, the idea is that you'll become a better version of yourself. That's what's kind of, it's pitched that way. And you can do that. You can go to a church where nobody knows you. You can blend in. I find that in the world, you find two kind of extremes. Either a small church, it's basically just like a, a family, like an actual physical family uh, with some extended family and some visitors, and it kind of, it always remains about the same number. Or a mega church where nobody knows anybody. So you have people that are committed only because it's just what they've always done, and it's kind of the family idea. Or you have people that kind of show up. You go if you want, and you leave if, if, if you want. Uh, even some of the bigger churches in Tampa, you find the kind of ads on Facebook where it's like, come see this incredible Broadway production of a play, and at the end, you can pray Jesus in your heart. We never met you. We don't know you. We don't know what you're about, but hey, you're saved. Is that, is that, is that Jesus' ministry? I, I think not. You know, I remember uh, last year during COVID, uh, my dad and I did a Bible study with somebody, and he said, yeah, man, at my church, it's awesome. Last week, 40,000 people got saved. I said, that's, that's pretty impressive. I said, well, can you explain a little bit more? He said, yeah, we had it. It was all virtual. Nobody actually showed up. We don't know who was watching, but at the end of service, we had the sinner's prayer. And we said, once you've said this prayer, you're saved. Now text 664-707, I'm saved. We had 40,000 text messages received. Glory be to God. I was like, what? That is not the Bible. That is not the Bible. You got to study the scriptures. You got to make decisions and repent because of faith. And you got to respond to the grace of God by becoming a disciple and getting baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You got to... Clean it out to beat about. Turn over to Romans chapter 6. You see, the revelation of the temple is awesome, but the celebration of the temple is on us. We've got to make sure that we're living in step with the word of God. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. This is Paul. He says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now the Bible says for you to be saved, the old man, the old woman must die with Jesus so that the new man or the new woman can be resurrected in glory. Are you with me? To live a new life. So we understand that this is the premise is spiritual, that you'll experience a spiritual death, a spiritual burial, and a spiritual resurrection to live a new life. Are you with me right there? Now, Paul reminds him, he says, listen, don't you know when this death happened that all of us who were baptized were baptized into Christ's death we were therefore buried with him and resurrected to a new life. Amen. Now, in the world, nobody will argue that at the end of the day, the old person must die so that Jesus can now live. That would mark salvation. Yeah. And when does this happen? Well, it says that you're freed from sin when you die yeah. in verse 8. Amen? Amen? Rather, verse 7. So when do you die? When you're baptized. Yeah. Now you go to church and you say, Mr. Pastor, do I need to be baptized to be saved? At 98% of churches in America, they'll tell you, yeah, you do need to be baptized. They say, if I'm on my way to my baptism and I die, will I go to hell? Of course not. Oh, so then I, I don't need to be baptized. Well, yeah. Okay, but if I'm not baptized, then I'm still saved? Also. So then I, I don't need to be baptized. Well, you should be baptized. You ought to be baptized. But just say what you mean, Mr. Pastor. No, you don't need to be baptized. 
well, that's what Mr. Pastor says. Well, let's see what God says. Amen? Amen. God says in Acts 2, verse 38, that the first time the gospel was preached, you've got to repent and you've got to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, we're not to believe that God is somehow arbitrary or aloof, amen, or hit the snooze button when you were on your way to your baptism and forgot and saw you crossing the street. Boom. Oh, you're dead. Oh, my gosh. Angels. He's not saved. Oops. That's not God, is it? And he says, I've got the whole world in my hand. I'm watching everything. And the man or the woman who understands and respects and honors God's word understands that we don't change the standard to where we are. We change where we are to meet the standards. We are not in any way given the prerogative to modify what the word of God says so that it's more palatable or more acceptable to the world. That's not what Jesus did, which is why he was executed, assassinated, and murdered. Because he refused to compromise. He refused to bend. He says, no, you got to do it the way that the Bible says. So we understand if you are still a slave to sin, are you saved? No. 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 If you've not been freed from sin, are you saved? No. no. When do you die? When are you freed from sin? When you die. When do you die? When you're baptized. Amen. Just like Corey's getting baptized today. Yeah. Jesus' vision for the church is for it to be a house of prayer for all nations. I want you to look to the person to your left and to your right and take a moment and say, you're a miracle. Look both ways there. If you're a baptized disciple this morning, you resurrected from the dead. You participated in the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. Why, why, do we get, why do we get so fired up when people get baptized? Well, number one, they're being saved. Their sins are being forgiven. This is an act of God. This is the very miracle of God. Faith plus repentance plus baptism, salvation. And, and you go, and, and, but what, what makes it extra special? Why, why are they being saved? Because they're experiencing again, and we're seeing demonstrated again, the greatest miracle that ever happened. Jesus resurrected from his grave. That's what we see. And it's been so awesome to see the slew of baptisms that we've had in the past couple of weeks. What's the challenge? Clean it out to be devout. Turn over to Matthew chapter 27. I've only got two points. Amen. Amen. Matthew 27, verse 38. That's my gift to you, a short sermon. No leaders meeting, amen? Coal in your stockings. Here they come. Matthew 27, verse 38. This is the end. Two robbers are crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the son of God. You know, it's incredible is that this was the prophecy that Jesus made about himself. He says, I'll destroy this temple and raise it again in three days. People knew about what Jesus said. And when he was dying, they taunted him. They tested him. I think after all the physical suffering, this, this might have been the hardest moment where, where they're... they're Genuinely misunderstanding of what Jesus really is all about and then and then poking fun at him. See, Jesus, prove it. We're all here. If you do it, we'll believe in you. Go ahead, Jesus. Come down off the cross. I gotta believe that in that moment, everything in him just wanted to kind of pop the nails out of his wrists, pop the nail out of his feet, and just kind of come down off the cross and then levitate back up into heaven in the sky and like Kind of like Storm from X-Men or like <laughs> Iron Man. And like his eyes just a, a blaze. And just like, and everybody's like. <laughs> you know there's a new Matrix movie coming out. 
and then he brings it in real close, but real slow. <laughs> now you know, but you don't have the chance to repent. Wow. Explosion, lights out, he goes back into heaven. All of us, hopeless. He says, no, you've got to believe in the word of God. You've got to believe in the prophecy. You've got to believe in the resurrected Christ. That is, that is underestimating the fact that Jesus raised from the dead. Amen. You know, it goes on here in verse 45. And it says from the sixth hour until the ninth hour. That's, that's about from nine in the morning, or rather from 12 in the afternoon to about three in the afternoon, okay? Darkness came over all the land. Could you imagine if all of a sudden, right now, it just turned into nighttime, what would that make you feel like? Would that send a shiver down your back? Oh, yeah. You'd be like, what is going on? It says here that at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split. The tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people that died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened. They were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Point number two, torn apart to reveal God's heart. You know, if you go to Exodus, let's turn there. Chapter 26. We'll find some insight about the curtain of the temple, also known as the veil. In Exodus chapter 26, Verse 31. Got to get into your Old Testament right there, guys. Amen. It says here in 26, verse 31, make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, finely twisted linen, with cherubim worked into it by a skilled craftsman. Hang it with gold hooks on four posts of acacia wood, overlaid with gold and standing on four silver bases. Hang the curtain from the clasps and place the ark of the testimony behind the curtain. The curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. Place the table outside the curtain on the north side of the tabernacle and put the lampstand opposite on the south side. It says this curtain was just absolutely gorgeous. Blue and purple and scarlet yarn twisted into a fine linen with gold emblems of the angels blazoned on the curtain. You know, history holds that the curtain was about four inches thick. Not wide, but thick. This is not a, a flimsy kind of curtain, just like one of those things at the car dealerships, no. blown and tossed by the wind. This is the curtain of God. Now, when Jesus died, it says that the curtain was torn from top to bottom, signifying that this happened as an act of God. If it were to be from man, they would tear it from bottom to top. But instead, it was God that opened up what was divided by the curtain. Why did he do that? Because Jesus is the new curtain. God tore the old curtain apart to reveal his heart. Why? So that we can come in to his presence and so that he can go out into all nations. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7. It says here, only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people that they had committed in ignorance. Chapter 10, verse 19 to 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience 
and having our bodies washed with pure water. If you study Leviticus chapter 16, you find that only once a year did the high priest enter into the most holy place. And what he would do at the Holy of Holies was first sprinkle some blood of a bull that was sacrificed. Now, this was to atone for his sins and the sins of his family, all of which were committed in ignorance. Amen? You see, ignorance is the source of sin. It's a lack of understanding and a lack of knowledge. And, and what we understand is that all sin is stupid. Amen, guys? Amen. It's, it's never a good idea to sin. It's always a bad idea. Are you with me? It's always the right idea to be righteous, to make the sacrifice to remain righteous. Now, to make the second sacrifice for the people, two goats were brought. Now, one goat, they would choose which one would die and which one would be released by casting lots, basically rolling dice. Amen? So the dice would be rolled or the, the lots would be cast, and then the one goat would be chosen to be sacrificed. His blood now being sprinkled on the mercy, the mercy seat. Now that second goat would be taken to the outskirts of town and then set free and released and sent away. This signifying that the sin of the people was being taken out of the community and sent into the wilderness. Wow. Now this goat was called the scapegoat. Oh. Who was the lamb that was sacrificed for us? Jesus Christ. Who was released to be set free? You and me. The two goats would be brought. One would be slain and the other freed. Jesus is the new veil. Jesus is the new curtain. And because of that, we enter the most holy place with great confidence. This is where everything changes. Verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, I just love this scripture. We always talk about it when we do the last study before baptism, the church study. He said, listen, the Bible actually calls us to spur one another on. You guys know what a spur is? That thing on the back of the, of the boot, you, you put it in the side of the horse, amen? I know some of us are really animal lovers right there, amen, but... That's what the Bible says. Uh, the point is to make the horse go, to make the horse go faster. And it says, actually, that we should spur one another on towards love and good deeds. So imagine, if you will, for a second, this is what the Bible says. I don't want to stretch the word of God. Uh, Ralph there, he gets up on Michael, and he just starts like, yeah, 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 spurring Michael on. That would be a little crazy. Does it feel good to be spurred? No, does it feel comfortable to be spurred? Is anybody ready? Does the horse, like, prepare for a spurring? Of course not. Now, what are we spurring one another on towards? More love and more good deeds. God wants to stretch us. He does not want us to remain in a comfortable state. He wants us to be in a place where we've got to rely on him. It says we're committed, not, not just in the beginning, but all the more as we go. Our commitment level increases. Why? Because we're either getting older and closer to dying, and Jesus is closer to coming. Yeah. One of the two is going to happen. You're going to meet the Lord. The longer you're around, the shorter time you have. I, I, I put before you, you don't back off your commitment. You, you double down and you increase your commitment, Amen. doing more now than you've ever done before. Amen. Are you with me right there? This is what it's all about. You know, back in Matthew 27, verse 52, it says when Jesus died and the temple was the curtain was torn it says the rocks split open so there's just like this and there's like little rocks flying everywhere and then the bodies of many dead people resurrected and kind of just started to go around the city in jerusalem this is incredible and this is what happens when a miracle occurs and when you're baptized your sins are forgiven and you become the holy the temple of the holy spirit finally look over at hebrews chapter 4 Verse 14, it says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who's gone through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then, brothers and sisters, approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When you have that need, 
The only thing that will really help is a relationship with God. By design, there's a distance, there's a gap, there's a void in your heart. And the only thing that can span that gap is time with the Lord on bended knee, going into the most holy place and finding your strength in prayer. Some of us have gotten weak. Going to prayer is where you find your strength. Going to prayer is where you're bolstered. Going to prayer is where your courage will increase and you'll be encouraged. You'll come out of that prayer fired up. I find myself, even after being a disciple for 15 years, still tempted to look into other areas to find strength. Sometimes I think I need extra sleep to find strength. Sometimes I think I need just a little bit relaxation. I, I don't want to burn out. You've heard that kind of thing before, right? Sometimes I just need me time. I, I need to be alone uh, to, to just get on Facebook for about three hours and zone out. And the reality is the only thing that will strengthen you, the only thing that will span that gap is approaching the throne of grace with confidence. There is no person on planet Earth that can touch you and in your need other than Jesus Christ. Amen. It's only your relationship with him that will make up the difference. And when you're there and Jesus is meeting all your needs, you're being strengthened and bolstered and encouraged. It will become, again, the celebration of the temple, remembering that you've got to clean it out to be devout. And God tore it apart to reveal his heart. I love you. Wow. Merry Christmas. Thank you.